Uh, I'd just like to welcome you all here tonight for tonight's presentation. Um, it's been hosted by the Structures and Construction Division of Engineers Ireland. A very interesting and exciting topic which is entitled Fluid Flows for the Built Environment. Uh, we're live webcast tonight as well, which is, which is great, and uh, available on playback. So I'd like to welcome all those that are watching live online. Uh, this presentation by ARP will have three main presenters, uh, which in the sequence will be Dr. Christina P Padlino, Dr. Jennifer Keenahan, and Ray uh, Raymond McRaymond. Just to give a brief introduction on each of the speakers for tonight's presentation, uh, Dr. Christina Pablino has an aerospace engineer who has specialised in the field of computational fluid dynamics CFD. She has over 11 years' experience in the field of numerical modelling of airflows. Uh, Christina manages a team of CFD specialists in Arab's Dublin office, which provide a wide variety of flow analysis for buildings, including indoor thermal comfort, fire and smoke modelling, H H HVAC modelling, wind simulations and fluid structure interactions. Since arriving at ARP, uh, Christina has used the knowledge required from her PhD in aeroacoustics to investigate the fluid, uh, sorry, the fluid dynamic phenomena underlying the generation of airborne noise from building facade elements. With her team, she developed a numerical, a numerical methodology that can predict if a facade will generate noise when exposed to wind. Um, our next speaker after Christina will be Dr. Jennifer Keenahan, uh, who is a chartered engineer and a modeling specialist in our CFD team. Applications include internal, com internal thermal comfort of buildings, external pedestrian wind comfort, wind loading and pressure distribution on structures, flow of smoke and fire, aeroacoustics and tonal noise assessment of facades and boiler emission analysis. Uh, Jennifer is a bridge design engineer involved in grillage modeling of integral concrete bridges and using Oasis GSA software. Adzec software and Soft Sophie Plus, the local modelling of wing walls, longitudinal and transverse deck elements, strut and tie modelling of the pier crosshead, and the detailed design of bridge elements, technical assessments reports, and, de and design risk assessments. And then uh, our third speaker tonight will be Raymond McRaymond, a chartered engineer. Uh, Raymond is a senior engineer, uh, senior member of the Arab CFD team, undertaking two research masters in civil engineering at, at Johns Hopkins University, Baltimore, USA and was awarded the Fulbright CRH award to undertake this master's. Uh, his research examined the fluid structure interaction between wi wind and bridges. Raymond's previous, previously worked at Rona Donovan Consulting Engineers in Ireland, where he gained significant experience in relation to bridge design, road traffic, and traffic engineering, working on a variety of major schemes. Um, there will be a short questions and answer session at the end of the presentation, so I'd be grateful if questions could be held until the end uh, till of the presentation, please. And I'd like to all welcome our webcast viewers tonight that will be able to watch online and also on playback. For our first speaker, I'd like to welcome Dr. Christina Pablino. Thanks, Christina. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. So the topic of today and uh, what we, we do in Arup with uh, my team uh, is uh, CFD modeling. What is CFD? CFD is computational fluid dynamics. Uh, and uh, we are going to show how we're going to use uh, this uh, new technology and numerical method to, to solve problems in the built and environment um, uh, field. Fluid flow are quite complex uh, and uh, have been forgotten for many years in the civil industry. Why that? Because uh, basically fluid flow is something that has been treated a lot in the aerospace sector, in the nuclear sector, but uh, for, um, we didn't have uh, uh, years ago the capability in IT to deal with a very long simulation. So today we have this uh, opportunity in the civil industry and now a simulation that used to use a lot of time, can be done in a couple of weeks. Plus, uh, we didn't have uh, the background necessarily in the civil industry to deal with fluid flow. Um, most of the uh, engineers don't treat uh, very deep uh, fluid flow problems, don't go in the deepness of the Navier-Stokes equation, which are very complex. What we have done in Arup is to build a, a team that instead uh, is uh, done by fluid dynamicists and can have uh, bring those expertise that we lack uh, in the uh, current uh, building and design construction sector. Fluid flow can basically from the outside of the building till the inside of the building can interact with uh, our design in many ways and most of the time they interact in a way that creates problems. So we have wind in, uh, around structure, we can have uh, fire and smoke within buildings that is, is again fluid dynamics. We have HVAC system, 
and we can have uh, uh, the analysis of particular condition within uh, uh, particular rooms like data center for example we have uh, a different way that fluid flow can inter interact with the structure for example generating problems and we can have also um, the airborne noise so again another unwanted problem in uh, uh, the civil industry so we can have different problems created by the not understanding of fluid flow from outdoor condition hvac system natural phenomena like fire and smoke we can have a structure interaction all these kind of things if not treated well and not predicted at design stage can end up with a huge um, critical issue at the end when your uh, your building is built we apply in arup cfd to different sectors so Today, we are gonna, each of us, we're gonna show uh, some of the project where we use a different physics, different numerical technique, but again, all the same CFD approach to tackle problems that are regarding thermal comfort, wind, air acoustic, and also fire. I'm passing the word to Dr. Jennifer Kinean, which uh, is uh, our expert in thermal comfort and the indoor microclimate. Um, so I suppose uh, the first thing to consider is why we might model uh, thermal comfort uh, w rather than using uh, hand calculations or, or more conventional methods. Um, well, buildings uh, by their nature and, and by how uh, architecture is, is continually developing, uh, they are often more often having very interesting and unusual uh, shapes and sizes and, and the locations of the openings. So it's not necessarily intuitive uh, where the thermal flows, where the heat and the cool, uh, cool areas will be. Um, so CFD modelling can account for this because we can import the geometry exactly from the AutoCAD model or, or the SketchUp model uh, into our software and we can model where the, the hot and the cold areas will be. Um, we can look at mixed modes of ventilation, if there's a mixture of natural and uh, mechanical ventilation, uh, lots of different extraction points and, and openings. Um, we can look at HVAC assessments, at uh, the impact of the wind. Um, we can look at uh, facade uh, elements, particularly Brise Soleil, and how that might affect uh, the thermal comfort inside the building. Um, we can look at thermal losses, uh, air tightness design, and crucially what we can do with modelling is very quickly and efficiently compare lots of different solutions. Um, so, of course, thermal comfort of people is intuitively what we all might think, but the thermal comfort of machines is actually quite important too. Uh, a, a standard computer will warm up quite a bit during use. If you have a whole building full of computers, full of machines, it's going to get very hot very quickly. Um, typically, at the moment, data centers are designed based on an energy in, energy out approach. Uh, we will know how, how much heat is in there, and we will know, therefore, how much we need to cool it down. Um, but there's a lot of room for error. And in particular, the operating conditions in terms of temperature and humidity for data centers are quite strict uh, as per the ASHRAE codes. Um, and really our client wants confidence that the data center and the HVAC system that has been specified for them will perform optimally. Um, so what we in CFD, in computational fluid dynamics, can do, we can look very specifically at the temperatures of the servers, how they heat up and cool down. Uh, we can look at whether there's a risk of stagnation points, whether it will be a very, very hot zone and a very, very cold zone and not enough mixing. Um, we can take a look at where the cooling units are placed and where the floor grills are placed and ultimately optimise the cooling system for a particular design of data center. So a recent project that we were involved with uh, was a data center based here in Dublin. Uh, there were two data halls, uh, A and B. They were of similar size. Um, and the functionality is for those who are maybe not familiar with data centers, typically there is a raised floor and the cold air passes in and around the underneath of the floor and comes up to cool the computer units. Uh, and then goes back into the top of the cooling unit to be cooled down and recirculated. And that's typically how data centers are cooled down. Um, so 
In this particular example, we looked at the normal mode of operation, where we had uh, quite a number of cooling units based on the top and on the bottom uh, of the data center. Um, and we first of all looked at whether this would perform optimally with all cooling units in operation. But then we also took into account an emergency situation where some of the cooling units might get, uh, might, might be turned off or, or broken. Um, and we found in both cases that yes, this data center would be okay, the HVAC that had been specified would perform efficiently, and there wouldn't be an overheating of, of the data center. As an additional piece of work in this case, we also did an external flow analysis. So there was, uh, it was suspected that the external chiller units, uh, which are these pink areas down here in the bottom left, uh, were not performing efficiently. Um, the contractor involved suggested adding some plates to the chiller units, which would separate the outflow and the inflow, uh, as it was suspected that some of the outflow was getting sucked back in again. Um, so we uh, were able to add these plates to our model quite efficiently and test whether this would be a viable solution and found that actually no, there were going to still be uh, significant problems uh, with the outflow being sucked back in as inflow. And so before anybody, uh, the client or the contractor spent uh, any significant money on remedial works here, we were able to demonstrate that it would not be an effective solution. Another interesting project involving thermal comfort uh, has been a hospital bedroom uh, that we have been involved with. Um, for this particular design, uh, it was hoped that natural ventilation rather than mechanical ventilation could be used. And so the windows uh, would open and close and that would be sufficient um, to provide the four air changes per hour uh, required uh, to provide fresh air for the room. Uh, of particular importance was to maintain a minimum temperature of 22 degrees Celsius. Babies are not particularly good at self-regulating their own body temperature, so it's quite important uh, that it doesn't get too cold. Uh, in this particular case, we did an analysis of the local temperatures and found that an appropriate outdoor temperature um, would be about minus four and a half degrees in the winter, um, and applied that to our model uh, where our model had uh, included all of the other important elements, uh, the heating panels, the radiant heating panels on the suspended ceiling, um, the various extraction points, the fans in the ensuite toilets, uh, the louvers themselves. Um, and we modelled all of this information and found that uh, actually the bedrooms were not going to be warm enough. Um, at best, they might be 17 or 18 degrees Celsius with the windows open and during the winter time. Uh, so we did have a, a video here that kind of captured um, the information. Unfortunately, whatever way we embedded it in the presentation means that I can't show it to you. Uh, but these pictures uh, do demonstrate um, the realities of when we put the heating panels on a suspended ceiling and we then have openings nearby that it's not likely we'll, we'll have a room that's sufficiently warm. Um, so I'm now going to pass back to Christina who's going to talk a little bit about the fire and smoke applications that we have. A quite a well established uh, um, discipline uh, where uh, CFD has been uh, the first time used in the civil industry was a uh, fire engineering. Basically fire and smoke uh, respond to the same law of fluid dynamics that uh, airflow respond. So uh, what happened is that uh, there are some way that you can predict uh, the production of smoke from a fire, but however you cannot really predict how, how this uh, smoke will move within a building because there are many forces that uh, are uh, interacting with the movement of smoke. In general, uh, you have to take uh, in consideration buoyancy, so the variation of density of the smoke due to the differential temperature, and uh, also the uh, action of pressure that can be either uh, determined by wind, by air velocity within the building, and also by the ventilation system. So there are analytical means that has been used in the past by engineers, and this uh, formula helps us to understand how much uh, smoke will be produced by a certain fire, depending on the fire side or on the fire load. 
However, um, these uh, calculations are not enough. So there are a lot of prescriptive codes that tell you how to use uh, these calculations and they tell you what to do in order to contain uh, the smoke and fire movement within a certain uh, area. If we use this uh, guideline, we couldn't not have uh, the amazing building that we have uh, at these days, where uh, basically you are uh, having very much uh, very big open plans, you want to have uh, kind of artistic features and, uh, and you care about the aesthetic aspect of the building, not only its functionality and safety. The role of CFD modeling comes into fire engineering, most of it because you want to try to create something that goes outside the prescriptive codes. So in this way, you have to demonstrate that your ideas, your design, even if they are not compliant, are still good enough and safe. And sometimes they are even safer than the one that you would have uh, found by following the, the rules. That's why, because basically you optimize the design to the uh, to the building that you are working on it. You can evaluate uh, all the conditions within a specific uh, area of uh, concern, like the evacuation route, uh, the escaping doors, and you can uh, even uh, assess the thermal condition within a certain compartment, for example. So we, you can really design system in this way that can take uh, into account all the features of the building and implement those fire safety measurements that uh, really utilize your building layout and they are typically right for that particular building. I want to show you a brief uh, um, project example of how CFD uh, helped us to really cut in age uh, what the, the code was uh, required and go to a design um, uh, limit that uh, were quite stretched. This uh, was a project in uh, Qatar, an uh, airport terminal that was uh, having a walkway extended up to three kilometers. So if you have to think about uh, going with prescriptive code, you would have, have uh, to have compartmentation every so often. So you have to basically divide these three uh, kilometers of walk away in uh, smaller areas. With all uh, that concerning a lot of the structure, the ventilation, the evacuation, the escaping route. So you have to add much more of what uh, is normally uh, required. Um, CFD in this case was used to justify a open plan area with a less uh, um, evacuation route and also with uh, a, a use optimized of the ventilation system. So basically, instead of having uh, three different uh, compartment, we had three different smoke zone control. So basically, we had the mechanical system operating on each of these control zones, depending on uh, if the fire was located in a specific zone. So in this case, without any separation, we virtually separated the ventilation system. We had to model that, so we have to uh, try a fire scenario, few of them, and to uh, verify that the condition within each of the smoke control zone were safe enough to allow the people to leave that con smoke control zone where the fire was happening and to, um, to evacuate into the next uh, adjacent one. So uh, this is something that CFD helped us uh, to, to show to the authority. How do you show that? Basically, you you model your physics, in that case the fire, you demonstrate that uh, all the important uh, variables, for example visibility and temperature during an evacuation are very important, were kept with a, uh, within a certain limit. That are typically picture that you get from a CFD analysis, so you get slices where uh, uh, the physics of a certain quantity is quite clear to understand. We are going to show now with uh, Raymond, that is our expert in uh, wind uh, analysis, some uh, kind of cutting edge project that we do also for uh, wind assessment. So I think it's important uh, when we're talking about winds to just take a step back for a minute. And if we consider why wind engineering is important in terms of civil engineering. Um, so the Meyer Kieser building in Miami, this building, uh, failed under uh, wind loading 
and why did it fail? Well, it had no allowance there was uh, for for wind. There was no there was very little cross bracing in the, in the building. It wasn't designed to take the lateral loads of the wind, and it failed. Um, even in in the future, in, with the John Hancock building, where they did know about wind loading and they did take it into account, there were still panes of glass falling off the building, and it suggested that this was due to the the forces of wind acting on the building. Um, and the City Court building in New York um, is a is a famous example where they did actually take wind in uh, into account in the design, but they uh, didn't didn't design it correctly for the wind, and due to its unconventional nature, it had to be retrofit to take the wind loading. Um, and it, it further back into the past, um, the Tay Bridge is probably the most classic example where there was no allowance for the wind loading uh, in the design, and it ultimately let, let, led to its collapse in 1879. And um, we're all aware of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge where it collapsed uh, due to the dynamic uh, excitation of the wind and the interaction between the bridge and the wind. Um, but even this behavior was found as early back as 1836 uh, with the Brighton Chain Pier. But it wasn't until uh, 1940 that this uh, issue started to be tackled. Um, and this issue was tackled using wind tunnel testing. Um, so when we're designing for, the, uh, for wind today, um, we design in accordance with the Euro code, and the Euro code relates to land-based structures, and it, it looks at uh, buildings that are uh, 200 meters in height and 200 meters in length. It also has a consideration for dynamic effects, and really this is just to identify uh, occasions when your structure may suffer from dynamic effects, but essentially the Euro code asks you or suggests that you seek the advice of a specialist. And traditionally, when you're seeking the advice of a specialist, you would go uh, and you would go to a wind tunnel and do some wind tunnel testing, and they would advise you uh, the best way to proceed with your design. Now, CFD gives the opportunity, uh, an alternative opportunity or a collaborative opportunity with wind tunnel testing. Um, wind tunnel testing uh, tends to be uh, quite expensive to do. It does require, uh, normally at the scale of large buildings and, and bridges, we're talking about smaller scale models, and there's difficulties in terms of similarity. Um, there's difficulty in changing uh, your model design quickly. Um, CFD gives you the benefit of being able uh, to change between different models very, very quickly. So it's more suited to an iterative design approach, um, and it allows you to optimize your solution. Um, so, when we talk about the structural scale, um, whether it's a wind hole test or CFD, we can use uh, both approaches to look at the static, static pressure, so the forces acting on the building. We can also use it to look at the fluctuations that act on the building. And in terms of uh, fluid structure interaction, whether it be vortex shedding, where vortexes are shed off the building, or galloping where there's large oscillations uh, in the building, or flutter, which was the phenomenon that took down the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. Um, um, let's just go past this ad. Let's get past it. There we go. So, so the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, due to flutter, started to oscillate. Um, this uh, phenomenon was discovered using wind hole testing, and really the area of wind engineering started with the Tacoma Arrows. Um, it developed what was developed for aerospace, um, and they applied it to bridges, um, and this, dev this developed the field of wind engineering. Um, now, with CFD and the computational power that we have, we're able to we're able to repeat a lot of the stuff that was done at wind hole testing. So. Uh, you can also, uh, as well as doing the wind toll test, you can now look at multiple different options of your bridge and optimize it. Um, but we were, there we were considering uh, wind actions on a structural scale. Um, and obviously, 
the benefit there is if you can design a structure in advance um, and you know that it can withstand the wind loading, that you can make uh, savings, you, you, you can have confidence in your structure working. But there's also need to look at wind actions on a human scale. Um, this is a video of a person up on Mount Washington. Um, there's a hundred mile an hour wind and you can see how hard this person is struggling to, to keep their balance. Um, and in a minute you'll see him walking into the wind um, and how powerful that kind of wind has uh, can uh, act on a person. Now this is Mount Washington. Uh, it's the windiest place on the planet. Um, and you're probably thinking, well, these kind of winds can't happen in an urban environment where people live. Well, they can indeed. Um, and while you might think uh, that an urban environment can help, will, will largely shelter people from the wind, in fact, um, due to the configuration of the buildings, it can either disrupt the wind or it can actually make the wind, uh, speed up the wind and increase its, its velocity. Um, so this can be quite serious in Leeds with the uh, 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 white, uh, no, not Beetle. It's the uh, water bridge. Bridge water place. That's the one. Um, in Leeds, uh, it's a tall building. It's standing proud of the tower uh, of, the, the, of the surrounding buildings around it, and it was uh, caused high winds to be generated on the surrounding roads. Um, it made an environment that was very difficult for pedestrians to negotiate and on one occasion it actually uh, pushed over a truck and uh, took out a pedestrian. So these are, these are very, very serious effects and they're worth considering uh, at planning stage uh, to make sure your design is uh, safe for those around it. Um, so one of the issues that we consider uh, is the, the effect of funneling. Now what is funneling? Funneling is... Uh, the wind being forced between two buildings. So essentially it's the wind traveling down a can canyon and being accelerated by the narrower space that it has to f force its way through. Um, so this is a case of a storm hitting a city in Norway. Um, the wind is being funneled down the streets and you can see how difficult it is for people to, to, to negotiate. Uh, another effect is downdraft. So this is where um, high winds uh, are caught by a, a tall building that stands above the, the, the buildings that surround it. And that, those high winds are directed towards the ground. So you get much higher speed winds at ground level. And this is the effect that occurred at Bridgewater Place. Um, and you can see this woman uh, really struggle to, to stay standing. She's holding on to the, the traffic signal there to, to stay balanced. Um, and when we're talking about pedestrian comfort, we're not just talking about the forces that are acting on the pedestrian at street level, but we're also talking about the frequency that it occurs. If, if an event like that happens once every 100 years, you probably decide that it's acceptable. But if that's happening every day, it's no longer acceptable. Um, it's also about the activity that the person's trying to undertake. If the person is looking to walk down the street, they're more tolerable of a higher wind than if you're trying to read a book and the pages are flipping in front of you. Um, but we're not only concerned about streets, we're also con concerned about public realms and squares where people habitate, um, and also balconies at a higher level. Um, and not just the wind itself, but the dust and the noise that can get blown up into your face, um, this can make a, a very discomforting environment. Uh, so we did a, we were asked to do a study for the EXO building in uh, Point Village. Um, so the, the purpose of this study was uh, to decide whether it should be granted planning permission. Um, wind tunnel testing had been taken, uh, had been carried out prior, prior to this and they had identified certain problems. Um, the, we were asked to do a CFD analysis to develop a, uh, or to, to inform the design to come up with an appropriate mitigation measure. Um, so the EXO building is uh, 17 stories tall. It's quite, tall, it's quite a bit taller than the surrounding buildings. 
and we identified uh, downdraft as uh, the major effect, uh, major concern. Um, so we suggested that there should be a canopy placed along the full length of the western side of the building. Um, and then we, because uh, we, it was easy for us to modify the model, being that we were using CFD, we were able to test this solution and show that it was a, it was a valid solution. Um, so it was pivotal in, in getting planning permission. Um, we were able to validate our CFD against the wind tunnel test, and it was, a, we were po it was possible for us to identify the appropriate solution. So using CFD, particularly in conjunction with uh, wind tunnel testing, it, it can allow for efficient uh, modeling and an iterative design process. Um, and it, would, it was, in this case, was pivotal in, in getting the, the planning uh, permission that was required. And it's very hard to put a price on that. So I'm going to hand back to Christina for a tunnel noise. So we have seen some sort of application and cases where uh, uh, airflow has interacted with structure or either uh, internal uh, indoor climate uh, or also in the form of fire and smoke. There is also something else that can be uh, treated with the same law of uh, aerodynamics and uh, again can be uh, modeled uh, numerically by using CFD. Um, there are cases where airflow in interact in the, with the structure by and uh, cause the so-called airborne uh, sound. In this case, uh, can happen as uh, most of the time as a detrimental uh, issue, something that uh, is an unwanted sound, something that you don't want. Especially when we speak about uh, building facades that are getting more artistic and they kind of add uh, a nice feature to a building, so sometimes they become the signature of a particular architectural firm, for example, it's important that uh, the facade doesn't uh, end up having uh, problems. Uh, there, are, there have been a lot of cases anyway around the world where iconic uh, buildings, very tall and very beautiful from the outside, they instead uh, demonstrated to have a uh, uh, sound problem. And uh, at the point that uh, uh, was too late to do anything other than adding a uh, mitigation measure. I'm going to show you this video and it's important that you hear the sound that this building emits uh, more uh, and less uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. This is a Betan Tower, it's in Manchester, and uh, this video has been around in YouTube uh, for, uh, for a lot of time. So the people try to report uh, what is wrong with the building, other what is, is, it went right. What is generating the sound is this mover that uh, has been headed at the top uh, of the uh, of the building. It was kind of a critical uh, um, problem for the architect that designed the building because uh, the architect it, uh, himself lives at the penthouse on the top of the building so he has to listen the resident uh, to complain uh, every day. Of course the complaint they become also you know at the insurance level etc so become a court case and uh, he has to apologize and probably to to pay some sort of feedback um, this is uh, something that uh, you don't want to be famous for uh, design a super uh, beautiful building and then uh, uh, to have creating uh, this kind of problem so there are a lot of elements in a facade that can be tricky and can generate noise. Uh, there could be um, screening like, um, uh, like that, so kind of uh, artistic uh, um, holes with gaps, etc. There can be louvers with fins exposed to wind. There can be other artistic features like that. So everything that is going to be exposed to wind and has some sort of cavity or cutting edge can uh, actually generate unwanted sound. What can we do? There was a 
basically there is no way there was no way um, to predict this kind of phenomena at design stage the only thing that most of people can do is to use uh, existing guidance that are simply based on the fact that um, somewhere somehow uh, some people got some uh, measurement of a building that was already built has generated noise so what they tend to say okay because this building has generated noise in some part of the world let's say that similar facade will generate noise so tend to not to do the same design and is not what the architect want to do other ways uh, it's possible that uh, sometime you can build a prototype of the facade and uh, and test it in the wind tunnel test but uh, you can imagine that facade are usually a single piece very high very big and not all the wind tunnel test facility can have uh, this uh, big enough to reproduce all the free dynamics so uh, most of the time people just try a guess uh, not to forget about the problem if up here I, I have to pay a lot to uh, introduce mitigation measurement I, I did a research uh, in the past uh, and uh, I come out with a PhD out of my research where uh, basically I study this phenomena that are uh, air acoustic resonance uh, and uh, since I joined uh, the, the AROP team uh, we uh, use uh, the numerical method uh, developed during my research to assess the, the whistling risk around the facade. Basically, what is generating the whistling is the fact that uh, if you have a facade exposed to wind, you will have a phenomenon called vortex shedding. So, where vortices detach from the fins at a certain speed. Normally, the speed will, um, will increase, so the, the, the frequency of the vortices will increase with the wind speed increasing. But it can happen at a certain time, uh, under certain um, um, uh, fact that basically the uh, frequency instead of growing with the wind speed remain lock um, so it fix it synchronized to something else uh, most of the time what is synchronized with is the frequency of a cavity that is uh, formed by the building surface and the facade itself so with our numerical technique we found uh, in which way locking can occur in this way, we can distinguish between a design facade that is prone to generate whistling or is not prone to generate whistling. Of course, when you have to uh, try a new numerical method, uh, it's important that you try and you test it. So we tested, we applied the methodology for the first time years and years ago in uh, a building in Milan. And this was the type of facade that we treated, so fins uh, with a certain cavity to the building surface. And uh, we ran CFD model. The CFD model was uh, meant to find the frequency of vortex shedding uh, for each wind uh, uh, speed at which the facade is exposed. And uh, uh, to um, to plot the frequency, so with the FFT of the, of, the, of the frequency, we could find that some cases will show two peaks in the FFTs, which is the frequency spectra. In this case, it means that basically resonance is not happening. So the frequency of vortex shedding and the frequency, frequency of the uh, acoustic cavity are coexisting, but they kept separated. So the cavity is not able to lock in any frequency of vortex shedding. Some other case on the same facade under different wind speed they show instead resonance cases so that was the lock-in. In this way we could see by running numerical tests and CFD that we can distinguish between tonal noise occurring or not around a certain design. It is important that uh, uh, we have shown some application of CFD and that was only an overview of how CFD can be used in the environmental sector, in the building and construction as well. So how you get so confident in, uh, in tell people that uh, numerical method can actually be used at design stage and through all the design to advise engineers, architects, designers which way is the best for your, uh, your uh, final goal. So the important thing is that CFD sometimes is perceived as a software 
that someone can learn and can go and play a few things around. In our point of view, is uh, is not like that. The CFD is a a methodology, a numerical technique that uh, uh, has to be used by uh, expert in fluid dynamic, aerodynamic. That's why we have uh, a team and we try to develop further and further the knowledge uh, in, uh, in the physics. So we come back to first principle. We come back to first principle of uh, engineering, uh, go back in the theory, and also we kind of grow our knowledge uh, beside that also in the IT equipment because as I said at the beginning, years and years ago it was not feasible for the civil industry to have uh, a CFD model done. It would have taken uh, probably six months of time to do a small model and with uncertain result. Today we have machinery, we have IT equipment and a CFD model can be done in uh, reasonable time one week, two weeks, so it becomes more and more available for yourself as engineers, architect and designer to know if things are going to be right or wrong before you go to install and to uh, deliver your project. We are all here for any question and uh, we we would like to live on the, uh, some view of some project that we, we, we did with uh, using CFD, going from wind analysis, fire, acoustic, and thermal comfort. So uh, we would thank you for the attention. And uh, if my colleagues can join me, if you have any question, they can answer in their respective areas of interest. Thanks very much and a great presentation and uh, we'll take any questions from the floor if anybody really would have great. I'll just pass you the mic so people on the web can hear. Hi, uh, Ger Bethel from uh, Arab. Um, the building in Manchester, the fins on the roof, were they purely aesthetic or did they have some other function? Um, uh, and, and were they removed or what was the solution? Yeah, the you solution know? was that it was removed and was so much political that kind of, because a lot of companies try different ways, uh, but then of course nobody could stand up and say, I have the solution. So the solution was uh, to remove the louver. The louver was, uh, I basically was a coverage for the plants on the roof. Aesthetical, but up to a certain point as the functionality of coverage. Thanks. Hey, um, it's Shin from Arup. I was wondering which parameters do you get out from uh, a typical wind, a wind tunnel testing of, uh, for example, a bridge structure or, uh, or a building? Uh, so in terms of wind tunnel testing, um, it depends on what you're after. So um, you can get the, just the, the static force that's acting on the, on the structure. Um, you can get the uh, lift coefficient and the drag coefficients. Um, but you can also get um, the aerodynamic and aeroelastic so the, uh, coefficients. So the aeroelastic coefficients would be coefficients relating to uh, instability such as flutter or galloping. Um, or, well, yeah, and the, or you can get other coefficients for the vortex shedding as well. So it depends on what you're after. Um, but in terms of uh, what CFD can do, um, there's there's lots of papers out there showing that you can develop these uh, coefficients using CFD. Um, I suppose the challenge that's there for CFD is to do it consistently and reliably. Um, and that's, that's really where the challenge is with CFD, is to do it consistently and reliably. You can certainly mimic what's done in a, in a wind tunnel, and then you need to define it consistently and reliably. Uh, I was also wondering, how, how do you discover flutter uh, in a bridge structure? Uh, so there's there's two ways of testing for flutter in, in wind tunnel testing and you can apply it to CFD in the same way. There's a, a free vibration approach and there's a forced vibration approach. So with the free vibration approach um, you set it going in, in a wind um, and then you release, uh, you, you de de deflect the deck and then you release it and you 
you see how long it takes for it to uh, you know stabilize um, and you'll do this over and over again increasing the wind speed that's the impending wind speed um, and then you, you know, at, at a certain stage it will start it won't stabilize it will start to destabilize and you will you graph your results and you, you can determine your critical velocity there um, you can also uh, do it with the force method where you you set the bridge vibrating at a certain uh, uh, oscillation a certain for a certain vibration um, and again you you step up uh, the velocity that the is impen impinging on the bridge and it's a similar you get you look at your 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 lift coefficients your drag coefficients and it's a similar you plot your results and again you're looking for a where it crosses an axis and you identify your critical velocity so there, it's it's two two different ways to do the same thing okay it's martin from europe as well um i have two questions first question is concerning the uh, optimization process um how do you do it what is the approach do you have some kind of an algorithm that is doing it or you're basically building the models and trying by doing if you know what i mean uh, <coughs> the dream would be to have an infinite <coughs> amount of computational power yeah, that we could run thousands of models mm -hmm. at the same time and optimize for for a particular solution uh, computational power is not quite there yet for that kind of optimization <laughs> but certainly we can at the moment, we, we will frequently run a model, uh, assess what the outputs are, um, and then use that to make an informed decision about what we might change uh, for, for another model. Um, and certainly in the case of one of the wind studies that we did uh, recently, um, we had five iterations back and forth with the client where uh, they, they had an, an initial geometry. We suggested changes. They came back to us. We went back to them five times. Um, before ultimately uh, the, the, the planning application was submitted to Dublin City Council. Um, so in that case, it's, it, it is an optimization approach, but not in the, not in the hardcore mathematical yeah. sense of optimization. I guess that is important uh, at this point to say the difference between uh, a CFD modeller and a CFD modeller that only uh, use the software or knows the fluid dynamics behind. Yeah. And that's, uh, you know, if we get a result from a CFD model the first time, that is only for us to inform our background knowledge in fluid dynamics what is going to be different if we change one of the parameters. So uh, a person that has a background in aerodynamics uh, and fluid dynamics can read the pressure field and understand exactly what I'm going to change to optimize in a certain point that pressure field or temperature field. A person that only uses software has to probably run 1000 cases and not to get the solution. He's expecting the software to give the right design. So that is the difference. What we are trying to do with our knowledge in uh, fluid dynamics uh, is to get uh, use the CFD to inform something that is, is in our mind, our theory, how to move to get the goal, the final goal. So we don't need every time to run 1,000 models. That is crazy. CFD is a tool in the hands of experts in fluid dynamics to understand where to find the solution. And that can be done in maybe even two simulation. Or yeah. even one stimulation, for example. I think you know, it's. If yeah. you know, I think it's in every field of engineering like that. You can do it like by using the program thousand yeah, times yes, or just analyze exactly. The CFD software is not uh, yeah. intelligent as the user, you know. So yeah. the user need to use that tool to understand. Okay, I know how fluid flow move. I know what is the parameter that by change that mm -hmm. I will get this differently. You also said that you're basically coming back to the theory and you're like modeling everything from the very beginning. Of course, you're using some kind of a packages, yeah. but are you just like using some kind of a MATLAB programming or is it? We use MATLAB. Consider that we use different CFD software and we interface this software with different uh, um, mathematical uh, um, tools like MATLAB, we use uh, Paraview to pro post-process mm -hmm. the result, we have our own in-house program to uh, elaborate wind data. So um, our work as a CFD modeller is a lot uh, academic and theoric. Mm -hmm. 
So we we never forget uh, the the way to. And sometimes also we write equation by hands. You know, mm -hmm. the the best things to understand the fluid dynamic problem is to say, okay, these are my number Stokes equation. What can I forget and when I can I have to yeah. solve? And that is something that uh, we have continuously uh, have uh, beside the engineering day to day work. Mm -hmm. We have still keep up to date with the theory. All these kind of things. So a CFD modellers is kind of three profession. You have a fluid dynamics uh, person, you have uh, an IT guy that is quite smart with the using the system, but you also have uh, a mathematician. Uh, so it's kind of a mix uh, okay. of a uh, profession. One, one last short question. Um, what about the calibration of the models? Because of course you're modeling yeah. something on a computer, but you have to calibrate your yes. parameters that you're yeah. using so most of the time, uh, for different uh, aspects, for example, for depends, uh, on the depends on the application. So sometimes you have to rely and validate uh, the, the result against, uh, for example, uh, data that you receive from papers of research. Someone has done the test somewhere in the world, for example, in fire. Someone has done test about how things will burn, what kind of temperature they will generate. So you have to get this data, reproduce similar model, and calibrate the model against this data. But that is a validation of your model. Then there is an internal numerical validation that is come with the numerical mesh as to converge, all the sort of parameter need to be solved. So that you have a kind of checklist numerical that you can do, and then you have to also um, kind of provide that after that the model is correctly numerical is still valid so it represents something quite uh, good uh, if you compare against reality so you have to do different things and uh, Raymond can explain that with the wind tunnel uh, for example is uh, one way that we use to validate uh, our model in, uh, in wind yeah and the, the wind tunnel one is an interesting one because the, the wind tunnel itself has its own limitations um, and you're trying to reflect reality in a wind tunnel, but it doesn't quite do it itself. Um, and then you are validating off the wind tunnel. So um, an interesting exercise is to, to take a, a real life structure and do it at that scale and also in CFD and also do it at the wind tunnel scale in CFD and see how the results differ. Um, so um, it depends on the application. Um, in, in an ideal world, you'll, you'll have a perfect analytical solution that you can compare it with. Um, in CFD, due to things like turbulence and other flow complications, you never really get a true analytical solution. Um, so then you're, you're trying to make a best fit and uh, you're trying to find where someone, like Christina was saying, where someone has done a paper in the past and has very well documented and then you want to, to get your result as close as you can to that. Thank you very much and thank you for the presentation. Hello, thanks for the presentation, it was really good. I'm just wondering, is there, like, you touched on so many different fields there, is there any other ones, like uh, one that jumps to mind is uh, for maritime, in terms of modeling the flow in harbors and uh, bays, and, you know, in terms of um, uh, power generation and current flow, is, is, is it used for that, do you know? Yeah, it, it is an application. Uh, of uh, resolving uh, uh, water flow basically is the same uh, is the software are there can be the same the only thing that is a little bit limited at this moment is that sometimes when you look at a maritime application you look at very quite a wide domain you look at areas of kilometers and kilometers around a certain structure. So there are uh, software that are more basic and they perform some uh, um, rough and very coarse calculation and more, most of the time they are sufficient to uh, design a structure in the sea, for example. So sometimes CFD is not used because there are other basic calculations and are good enough. But there are uh, probably uh, more users, and we are entering in this field as well. So, so we would like to apply in the future. Yeah, so when I was in, in the States in Hopkins, um, one of the professors there, Professor Dalrymple, his area of expertise was maritime uh, CFD. Um, and he 
um, he's one of the most uh, famous people in the in the world for this application. So I did a small study with him to do with plumes in the ocean, um, but he would look at uh, sedimentation transport um, and you know interaction with harbors and various other things. And um, he's, his his interest is how to get pro good, very good, reliable simulations of you know wind effect and waves and all sorts of things. So it can be done. It's it's very intensive computationally. Um, so it's it's and also you've got you you have to take into account uh, different flow effects as well. So it, it's quite a complicated area. But yeah, we'd like to get into there at some stage. Thank you. I suppose my last question, or uh, one, 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 my, my question is probably basic enough. It's in terms of uh, the euro codes, is CFD an alternate uh, acceptable substitution for wind loads? Wind, uh, wind, wind tunnel yeah, testing? Yeah, so the, the, the euro code d allows for using uh, wind tunnel testing and CFD. Um, I suppose the big question is: Would the would your local authority or your 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 regulatory authority accept the wind tunnel analysis, or the sorry the CFD analysis? Um, for a lot of the ma the major span bridges, they do both wind tunnel testing and CFD. So uh, you'll see reports for both. Um, the a lot of the expertise in terms of those bridges, uh, in in terms of the wind analysis, of those bridges is in wind tunnels. Um, but more and more wind tunnels uh, th themselves are investigating CFD and have CFD modelers in there. So it's, it's getting there, certainly. It's, it's something that's growing. So potentially in the long term, or in the short term, it could be you know, significant savings gained from avoiding wind tunnel testing and you know, relying on CFD modelling. Yeah, there was, there was an interesting bridge in Italy uh, built recently, um, and they found they weren't expecting it to suffer from any wind effects. So it wasn't. It was designed in accordance with the Eurocode, and then when it was being constructed, they found it to be quite lively, and it was actually a concrete deck. It was okay. a, a, a quite normally sure. it's a steel deck that you'd be expecting that behaviour from. Sure. So they, it was on site. Um, they didn't have much time, so they did a CFD analysis of the deck, and they found an optimal deck cross section to stop that behaviour, and then they took that cross section and put it in the wind tunnel and tested that section of the wind tunnel and found that it was stable. They also tested the original uh, cross-section and found it was unstable. And then on site, they implemented that change. Um, so yeah, no, it's, 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 it's coming along. It's, it's, it's not that far away. That's, no, that's great. I'll just take one last question, and uh, I'll leave you guys alone. Thanks, Mayan. Thanks very much. It's actually a related question to the Euro codes. Um, <coughs> so, are, are you kind of are you of the opinion that there are actually limitations in the codes are actually aspects of the codes that can lead you to a wrong solution and do you see the writers of the codes actually not just taking the point about acceptance of alternative solutions but actually mandating uh, requirements or even abandoning some of the clauses in codes that to be honest lead to incorrect solutions do you know, is there any movement in, in the Euro codes to actually acknowledge and accept and revise those issues? Um, the, 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 the simple answer is I don't know. <laughs> but uh, I suppose... I um, think it can go both ways. Yeah. I think when, in the idea of the codes being wrong could be either too conservative or not conservative enough. And that varies depending on the application that we look at. So like the fire codes, for example, are extremely conservative and the CFD work that we're doing are demonstrating that we can be less conservative in that area. Whereas it's possible in, in the case of the wind loading that the, 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 the loading that we apply as per Eurocode is not enough. Um, so it can go either way in terms of being wrong. I'm not aware of any planned changes to the codes, but we can try. I guess that more uh, that people will uh, apply um, and, and try to to design with different uh, approach, either than following the code, that ev everyone can follow the code, basically. So the design will come, uh, um, your, let's say, your goal becomes in design something new, something better, something different, in, in growing by doing this. So, and sometimes uh, uh, the challenge becomes in forgetting about the code and try to do something that is cutting edge and cutting edge become with the risk of uh, or a new methodology. So I guess that this is what uh, people are moving towards. So probably the code 
what is restrictive and uh, prescriptive today may be not there uh, in time. That happened, for example, with fire. What was uh, normally um, prescribed in the guideline for fire, then uh, the history showed that uh, for uh, design in fire engineering, uh, CFD was used and different solution, uh, fire s uh, solution were uh, used uh, instead of the, the code, and then the code changed after. So now it's normal in a fire code to see you can show your solution by using CFD modeling, and I will accept it. So that CFD become part of the code, part of, of the of the rules as well. I think that wind is going to be like that uh, very soon. Also because wind, uh, for example, in the aerospace sector, that is a normal practice doing a lot of CFD modeling and you don't have code. You, you do a lot of CFD modeling and then you may do the last test. You know, you, you cannot uh, waste a lot of uh, <laughs> uh, wings of airplanes just to test and test. So you do that and, and that is normal applied in a field that is where safety and design is really uh, uh, very uh, important. So it's only a question of time. And well, I also think the code is developed to cover 99 or 95% of all cases. And it's there to be conservative for those 99 and 95 percent of all cases. Um, and where CFD operates is outside is outside of that area, or where wind tunnel testing operates is outside of that area. Um, and I, you know, there's wind load in in the code is generally assumed to be horizontal. Um, whereas in if you've got a downdraft, it's obviously you know it's a vertical wind load. So. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know. I know it took a long time to put the euro code together, um, and I don't know if there's that much appetite for people to get together and, and go through that struggle again. Um, and for the most part, the euro code for very conventional designs and structures seems to be adequate. Um, so I mean, yes, I'm sure it will advance in time, but I, I, I just think for the moment it's, and I think also in terms of CFD. Um, and the computational power, it, it's only going to increase. Um, and when the margins come down and when we can do an awful lot more, a lot quicker, um, then you'll see people straying from the code even more because there's an opportunity for them there. So. Thanks very much.